I'm Ari, your host at the Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to science and tech startups that will change our lives. It's a pleasure to welcome Rodolphe Besser, CEO at Euricare, one of the most impressive life science startup studio in Europe. Euricare was launched in July 2021 uh, in Brussels and Paris, uh, backed by 50 million euros uh, from uh, private funding. Nice to have you, sir. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Ari. Nice to uh, to talk to you and uh, happy to uh, to join this uh, this podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. It's very precious to have you because what you do for the startup ecosystem is precious, and it's having you today is very important. Um, this interview will be in two parts. Uh, the first part we'll talk about a little bit about yourself, uh, from a, um, a chemist engineer to the finance world, and then we'll talk about your role as a CEO of Euricare. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Thank you. So uh, could you uh, please uh, present your path from the freshly uh, graduate you uh, in chemical uh, engineering into the finance world? Um, yeah, so um, I, was, uh, I was graduated actually from the School of Chemistry of Lyon in France in a uh, long time ago now, 1996. Uh, I actually did a sandwich year uh, before, before that in the UK uh, between my, my second and my, and my third year. Uh, on the European R&D site uh, of Dow Agrosciences uh, in one touch close to Oxford in the UK. And that was a very exciting year. Actually, I was young and uh, it was amazing to be abroad. It was a good experience also in the lab. Uh, I was, uh, was working on, on the formulation of pesticides in a highly skilled team, working notably on, on cutting edge uh, technology at that time, uh, like uh, micro encapsulation, for instance. Uh, I was specialized in, uh, in, in analytical chemistry. I, I learned a lot during this year. And, uh, and then I spent my final year uh, at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany uh, with a specialization in water chemistry. So very uh, international profile, I would say. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but the conclusion also was that I was not sure at the end that I was ready to, to spend the, the the, the, the bulk of my life in a, in, a, in a lab. I enjoyed it, but maybe it was not for me. So after that, I, 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 I did a business school, uh, which probably provided me with uh, additional uh, feelings and uh, uh, which I mean, led to this career in, in finance after that, yeah. And uh, in the business school, did you specialize in, in corporate finance, in the, in the stock market, or, or it was it some, how was, the, I mean, your, your, because it was the, the first step to the you know to, to the finance world the business school yeah actually after the, after my uh, my my year in germany i did my military service uh, as officer in french signals uh, regiment in uh, in france and also that was a, i have to say a great experience on the human and management side uh, I, I was actually uh, quite close tempted to to stay in the army uh, my, my regiment was actually uh, very active and, and present uh, at that time in, in former Yugoslavia. But, you know, after uh, 18 months in the army, I eventually decided to, uh, to come to, uh, to, to civil life. So I, I did a business school in, uh, in Lyon. It was two years. Uh, and at that time, I had actually a very clear uh, professional objective, uh, which was based on my, on my previous experience. And this was to develop actually turnkey sewage uh, processing uh, stations in Asia. So you can see that it was <laughs> very precise. I, I had that in, in mind, actually, when I joined the, the business school. Uh, and, uh, but in reality, I, I have to admit that after uh, two, three months, I, I discovered a new field uh, I, I didn't know before. And uh, I really fell in love with, which was uh, finance and, and in particular market finance. So uh, I, I, we had the choice, you know, to, um, to uh, sort of cours à la carte, and uh, I, chose, I chose at that time a lot of uh, uh, course in, uh, in finance, and, uh, and then I did my internship, actually, on a trading floor uh, in, a, in a small brokerage house, and it was a, a great time, you know, it was the end of the 90s, uh, so still sort of golden age uh, for, this, uh, for this business, I love it, and Actually, one year after, I started working for this company uh, as a researcher. And so totally changed my, my, my professional uh, career or what I had in mind when I joined the business school. 
And I started as research analyst, actually covering the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, and I never uh, regretted it. Since uh, I think research analyst is, is a really exciting uh, job. Uh, you, you, know, you interact with uh, uh, companies, you develop your own view on, on those companies and you try to convince salespeople and asset managers uh, to buy your ideas. So I, I'm, I really like it. And uh, I exercised this, this profession actually for about 12 years. So covering big pharmas, mid cap pharmas, and then the biotech sector when I joined actually Société Générale in, in 2005. And you, you did great because I read that you have a, um, you have a ranked number one uh, analyst in France, right? Uh, in, in this sector. Yeah, no, it's true. I think it, it, I think it was, I was ranked uh, number one in 2010. Uh, so for any sector, so amongst wow. I mean, 250 analysts, I was number one uh, probably by, by chance also. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, some of the recommendations I made at that time, um, uh, the, the market was very volatile. So I had a chance, and uh, as I made good recommendations, I had the chance to have a, to have a huge uh, performance on, on those stocks. And so, yes, uh, I was elected first in, in France, but that was for one year. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it was quite, uh, quite funny. But definitely, I. Uh, I enjoyed this, uh, this, this, this job, which is now is a little bit different. I think it's probably uh, uh, less exciting than it was uh, at that time. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good way to, uh, to learn about the sector, to uh, understand the sector, the logics uh, with, uh, let's say, the big companies and the smaller companies. And, and particularly when I started covering biotech, I think it was... Uh, It was great since I, I, I really looked at uh, on, on the, on the R&D side of, uh, of the picture. And uh, yes, that was a very good uh, training also. It's very interesting with your, with your background and, uh, and journey, you know, through the finance that you are a kind of professional that understand pharma, biopharmaceutical company from, you know, the, uh, the listed one to the pre-IPO to, and now with the, with the, um, With the T zero, you know, of the of the launching of such venture, particular venture, because they are not like others, no, you know, they are very particular uh, venture. They have their own business model. They have their own regulation. So now, uh, this is very interesting to see that you have this kind of profile that can uh, have this vision from T zero to the post IPO, and this is great. Um, then you join the Société Générale and you perform it. Um, you conducted more than 50 transnational deals, including IPO, right issues, mergers, LPO, but all of this uh, experience were in the pharma, biopharma sector, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, again, I think the switch to the, to the biotech sector uh, was a real turning point for me. Uh, and uh, it was in 2005. So the, the sector was really emerging at that time in France. Uh, there were only three uh, listed companies. And actually, I had the chance to, uh, to start covering uh, also uh, many European uh, biotech companies from the UK, Germany, Switzerland, and so on. So uh, that's really how I discovered innovation, I have to say, since before that, uh, with pharma, <laughs> with pharma uh, was the bulk of the story were, were really defensive, uh, notably for the protection of their franchise against generic companies. And with the biotech sector, I really deepen my, my R&D knowledge. And as you say, after a, a couple of years, I had also the chance or the opportunity uh, to, uh, to switch to, to become banker, actually, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the group. I'm in charge of, uh, of the sector, so at Société Générale. And I actually created this practice. Uh, and I think it was a perfect timing. So in 2010, and we, we were very successful. So with Uh, more than 30 IPOs, uh, a lot of uh, various uh, tra transactions in the fields, not, on, not only in France, but also in, uh, in the rest of Europe and a couple of deals actually on the NASDAQ as well. So I have to say I had, I had 10 fabulous years. Uh, and, and actually, uh, over the last three years, between 2017 and 2020, uh, my, role, my role was enlarged uh, to all startup fields. So not only healthcare, but also covering IT, fintech, green tech, which 
was great since uh, it really opened my, my chakra, as we say. I discovered also many, uh, many uh, uh, new things uh, outside healthcare. And, and then came uh, uh, what is probably the project of my life, <laughs> which is the creation of Eureka so in association with uh, two family offices in, in 2020. So perfect transition. Now, la now let's talk about the, the, this, this amazing structure uh, venture, Eureka, because um, uh, the mission of Eureka is very bold and, and very important for the humankind. I, I'm not scared to, to, to tell it like, uh, like this. Um, so um, in entrepreneurship, you know, we are used to say that there is, when, when there is a societal problem somewhere, there is a space for a startup to, to bring a solution. What was the societal problem that you identify uh, and Eureka would be a great solution for that? So, in fact, when we, uh, when we decided to, to launch Eureka, so we had a lot of uh, brainstorming, so it was at the end of 2020, and we were in this uh, particular, of course, context of the, the COVID uh, crisis. But I think there were two main uh, motivations uh, to create this structure. First, uh, bring uh, the new kinds of investors uh, to finance early stage uh, projects in the biotech field. And uh, it's one of the principal issues I met myself as a banker. So, I mean, the lack of uh, dedicated biotech funds uh, or biotech investors uh, in Europe when you compare it with the, with the US. So that was, I think, the first, uh, the first reason. And the, the second motivation uh, was to uh, better exploit uh, the European academic research. Well, I think we had the feeling that there are great things in, in European research, which is well financed uh, in, in very early stage, uh, thanks to a lot of uh, very, very deep public, uh, public support. But this research can hardly, uh, hardly find uh, bridge financing uh, to go to the proof of concept. And uh, uh, I, I would say it's uh, essentially due to the fact, to, 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 to the lack of dedicated uh, uh, structures, um, and uh, particularly in, in a context where industrial companies and pharma companies in, in particular are, are very far from uh, fundamental research and really concentrate on late stage uh, projects and, and, and marketing of, of products. So I think when you look at COVID crisis and the, the, the development of uh, mRNA vaccines, uh, all this has shown that uh, uh, many innovations actually were originated from Europe, uh, but were eventually developed and exploited in the US. So uh, this is what we wanted to, to tackle with your accounts, really to, to be able to, you know, to, to finance in this uh, very specific moment where you are transiting from uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental research to the proof of concepts and where we know it's very difficult for projects or for new ventures uh, to find uh, uh, financing. So, um, and why did you choose the startup studio model? It could have been, I don't know, maybe we could have launched a VC uh, uh, an incubator or, or funding, you know, and, and, and establish accelerator. Why the startup studio in particular? Why, 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 why this solution was obvious that was the perfect solution? It was not uh, obvious at the beginning, but uh, I think uh, my, uh, my financial partners, you know, are, are very wealthy people. Mm -hmm. And they are called, I would say, really by all the venture funds of the world. So, uh, clearly, when uh, when we, uh, we we started uh, thinking about uh, what we wanted to do, uh, they wanted to invest in in, uh, in healthcare or in biotech in general, but not really uh, knowing at the beginning what we wanted to to do exactly. But the idea was clearly not to recreate something which already existed. So uh, we really wanted to uh, to innovate uh, in the way innovation is financed. Uh, that's, that was also one of the starting points, I would say. So we looked at different models. Uh, we definitely, we found uh, flagship ventures in the US uh, as a very inspiring uh, source of inspiration for, for us. Uh, and we started developing our own model. So which is based uh, part, partially on AI uh, for the sourcing part. So I think uh, this is an important piece. You know, uh, in our model, 
and also with a goal to, uh, I would say, to invert the, or revert the, the classic way of uh, classic investment mode of uh, of an incubator, which starts from uh, uh, discovery and try to find an, an application. So we wanted to, you know, to start from uh, specific thematics or problematics, and then uh, identify the right people uh, within uh, European. Uh, Academic labs to to work with us on this uh, on this problem. So that was really the the way we 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 started um, and was in twenty early twenty one. So after I would say three months of brainstorming. Yeah. So uh, it was um, an alignment, you know, uh, great people, great opportunity, and then the solution appeared as 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 a, as a obvious. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think the you know the post or COVID or post COVID context also help us to uh, to 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 come to come to this uh, to this specific model in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, we are uh, in terms of team and the way we are organized, uh, we are decentralized. Uh, we uh, all work at home, uh, and uh, we are ten people today. And uh, the fact is that probably before the crisis, it wouldn't have been possible. So this flexible model that uh, we have today uh, definitely is also the, uh, the result of this uh, specific context and situation, I think. Um, we have a ding, I don't know if it's from... Ah, sorry. Ah, I, thought, I thought it was from my side. Okay. Um, uh, you have a you talk about your team. You have a fantastic team. I already uh, have the opportunity to interview uh, Dr. Serge Pamphe, uh, Michel also, uh, your head comes, and uh, the following interview would be with Christine, Dr. Christine Thompson, fantastic professional. So you have a very strong team right now, um, and you have also uh, a scientific board composed of rock star in science. Uh, was it difficult to, to con contact these, these scientists, these top level scientists, and co seduce them and bring them on board? On the team, maybe. Uh, so we are uh, we are ten people today, and we are very operational in the sense that really the purpose is to be able to help every day. Actually, the companies that we create and accompany. So. Uh, it's uh, when you look at uh, the, the people in, in the, in the York team today. So you have a CSO, you have a CBO, uh, you have a person in charge of uh, uh, non-dilutive uh, uh, financing. You have uh, people in charge of IT. Uh, we want to recruit also somebody in IP. So we're able to accompany uh, the, the ventures uh, on any functions uh, that are needed when you when you create uh, uh, something. Uh, looking at the, the SAB, so yeah, I think we had the chance also uh, uh, when really when we started, so in 2020, to, to, to contact these people in, uh, in Europe and in the US through the network. And I have to say that uh, all the people that we contacted, so all the people we wanted to, to have in our SAB accepted, I think uh, they, they found the, the project uh, really great and they, they loved it and, uh, and they are, they are, they are really important, I think, in what we develop and what we do. Uh, they help us not only, I would say, in the long-term vision of uh, what we want to do and the, the, the segments we want to be present in, but also every, every nearly quarter, uh, we discuss with them about uh, the different projects that we, we propose to invest in. And so, yeah, they are very instrumental in, uh, in the development of your care. And, we, we wanted to have a good mix of people from the US and Europe, uh, which is the case. Uh, we don't have enough uh, women, I have to say, at this stage, so probably it will change in the future. We have to adjust this, it's very clear. We have a lot of women actually in the team at, uh, at Care. I think it's, uh, it's very important. We insist a lot on uh, diversity and uh, ensure that uh, uh, everybody can be uh, represented. So yeah, that's um, how we do it. Um, and this, uh, this SAB, uh, um, I think, is, uh, it brings a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas, uh, also a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, ways to, uh, to project ourselves uh, in, in the two segments we have, uh, we have selected here. Yeah. And perfect transition to the two segments, because you, you are 
focusing on microbiome and synthetic biology. And you talk about this two segment at the very beginning of the idea of Eurycare. So it was something you are you have already in mind with your with your co-founder. What why these two segments and um, uh, with these two era and uh, and how can I say uh, what what was for you the business potential of these two era and the outcomes for the humankind uh, they promise? Yeah, there are, I think there are different reasons for for this choice of for these two segments. First, I think when we we had a very analytical approach actually yeah. when we looked at the fields in the biotech in the biotech sector where uh, Europe as uh, good research and uh, can really compete with uh, US and, and Chinese labs. I think we, we came to the conclusion that well, well, probably maybe, maybe uh, uh, half a dozen of, uh, of segments uh, that were of interest. Uh, and among them, there were synthetic biology and, and microbiome. And we looked also at segments which are turning points. So where things could happen in the next two, five, 10 years, uh, which will uh, have some impact on the society uh, and which uh, will have also some impacts for, the, for these segments themselves in the sense that if we look at microbiome, for instance, um, you, know, you, you have currently two projects which are in very advanced stage in the US and which could arrive on the market. And we know that if they arrive on the market, so probably within the next 12, 18 months, there will be a lot of big farmers looking at this sector. So there will be a, probably a lot of also many transactions or investments from big farmers, licensing and so on. So this is a turning point. So things, something will happen, we know, in this sector. Uh, and there's a lot of research. Europe is, is very good at it. And also, uh, when we look at the two segments, I think they were complementary. Uh, this is probably more philosophical than, uh, than, than research, but... Uh, I think, you know, microbiome is the way we are uh, integrating in our environment. So it's not only the, the bacteria we've got in the gut or on, on, on the derma, but uh, it's also how we, we, we are uh, connected with uh, our environment. And we, uh, maybe you discussed with Serge about this uh, on different aspects uh, with uh, aerobiomics, with oceanobiomics. So we are linked with, uh, you know, the air, with the water and so on. So, I think from a philosophical point of view, it's interesting. And when you look at SimBio, it's the way we can also correct or modify from the inside, from the cell, uh, things uh, which are not good uh, and uh, can be mutations, can be uh, also environment, environmental pro problems, can be uh, new materials we want to develop and which are uh, cleaner. So I think you, you, you've got this link between the environment, what is uh, uh, the link between the, the, the humans and, 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 the, and, and its environment, and uh, also the fact that you can modify from the inside uh, things, and these things are you know very complementary, I think, from a, from a philosophical, philosophical point of view. And you've got another lab, by the way, since you can imagine bacteria that you modify also genetically. So, yeah, uh, this came to as as an evidence i think at some point that we had to to be present in these two fields of course i'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that I, I just wanted to ask you the question of, of course we, the microbiome is something has will completely change the paradigm of medicine in and not only the medicine but also agriculture and everything in the in the few in the few uh, coming uh, years Um, so uh, we we talk about your strategy and your 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 um, the, the two focus area you you want to, you want to, to commit in. Um, what are your uh, I mean your your financial milestone because we can't we can't talk about deep tech startup and particularly uh, startup studio in deep tech without talking without talking uh, the finance question. Uh, you have raised uh, an impressive uh, amount of money, uh, 60 million euros from private investor, right? Would you yeah, like to, yeah. to talk about your fundraising? Yeah, I think uh, one, uh, you know, one of the objectives when we uh, started Eureka was really to, to bring new uh, people around the table. So when I, I, you know, when I was an uh, investment banker before, one of the, the main limitations I observed was the 
the lack of new new investors uh, in, in in Europe in this field in bio, in the biotech field, which is always considered you know as a very technical, difficult, uh, risky. Uh, so that was one of the challenge, and we have been able to, um, I think, with a, a model which is different uh, compared to the, the ones that exist. We have been able to uh, to to raise these funds with uh, a dozen of family offices. Which are not from the biotech field, so uh, for, for some of them, it was even the, the first time they invested in uh, in tech uh, or in a venture like uh, of, uh, of, of, of of stuff. So I think it's uh, it's interesting. So um, uh, it was it went relatively quickly actually. We did it in uh, in three weeks. Uh, we could have raised more, uh, but there was I think the um, the, the objective to uh, to do to see it as a, as a series A, so we we, we see us ourselves as a, as a startup. So we did this series A with with the objective to um, create value and uh, raise additional money uh, in, the, in the next couple of months. So we we did this series A in May 2021, mm -hmm. and really the objective is to raise additional money uh, this year, later this year, I would say in the second part of this year. Uh, either through a series B uh, with uh, probably the similar type of uh, investors, I would say, family offices, or maybe an IPO. That's also something we, we could envisage. And your model is very interesting also because the money is, is in the equity of uh, Eureka. It's not in a fund, you know, to that. There are some studios who have a, a separate fund that back, you know, their, their venture. Your money is in your equity. That, that, is, that is very interesting also. So the next round will also be on this model or will, will it be on a separate fund to back your... your oh, it's, it's exactly the same model. I think uh, that was uh, part of the, uh, of the equation at the, at, at the beginning. Uh, when, we, uh, when we looked at it, of course, from a fiscal point of view, uh, it's less interesting for some of the investors. They are shareholders of the, of the holding which invest in, uh, in companies or in projects. Uh, the big advantage is, of course, that we, we, we get a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. thanks to this. We can invest in both projects uh, with biotech studios and companies, mm -hmm. uh, which a fund can, cannot do. So, uh, and of course, also, we don't have any specific uh, horizon uh, for, the, uh, for the investment. So, we are sort of evergreen so which is another big advantage so we've got time we can uh, uh, really uh, make uh, big bets on uh, on some company companies we believe in uh, in, the, in the long run and uh, i think uh, you know we we were inspired by the flagship venture uh, kind of uh, of structure uh, which of course is much much bigger than us Uh, but which is, I think, a, a good source of inspiration for, for us in the sense that it has been a, a great success. Uh, they, 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 they made uh, very um, risky bets, uh, but which paid at the end. So that's really the kind of, uh, of route we would have to, to, to have. And for me, uh, having a, probably an institutional investor, a VC on board, Would probably change a little bit the spirit that we that we have. Um, maybe we'll do it, but uh, it's not exactly what we want to do. I think continuing with the private in investors as we, as we did in the first round, or an IPO, which is a, a different uh, a different road, or, or opening also uh, additional opportunities is something we, we as I said, uh, we can consider. Yeah. And concerning uh, the way you will invest in uh, seed ventures. You, that you will cook inside uh, Eureka. Uh, how much will you will you will you um, invest per per uh, per startup range? So, yeah, uh, in, in terms of uh, strategy of investment. So just to to remind us, so we invest in very early stage companies, and we invest in late stage companies. So in late stage companies, really the, the goal is to have a rapid, I would say, turnover on the, on these lines between 18 months, 24 months max, mm -hmm. and we invest between one and five million euros per, uh, per company. Looking at the early stage, which is your, your question, so in the biotech studio, for each line, we intend to invest between three and four million euros. Wow. A, time, a period of time of uh, three to four years, 
uh, to reach the proof of concept and then switch to a classic uh, series A. Uh, the Biotech Studio we've got in Belgium now uh, has the, an objective of uh, five to 10 projects uh, to, uh, to, uh, to incubate. Uh, and uh, we, um, we, will, we will raise 10 million euros in this first studio. And we want to replicate this model. So Belgium is, uh, I would say, the first uh, lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will uh, uh, open additional studios uh, with partners in additional countries in the, in the future. Great. Uh, the, the amount you want to commit in the early stage is impressive, and I think it's, it will make a, a clear difference because in the life science and biotech field, um, you know, the, the capitalization at the T0 is very important. It's not like the IT, uh, high velocity startup, you know, where they can start with a computer and some couple of euros. In the biotech, they need a lot of money and a lot of support, and, and this will make a, a huge difference. And no, I fully agree, I fully agree. And, uh, you know, uh, also what we observe is that uh, many uh, VCs have raised a lot of money and so have... Uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, exited this, uh, this field of, uh, of seeding or pre-series A. And so there's definitely a need uh, that, we, that we can address with, uh, with Eureka. To continue about the fundraising of Eureka, um, you talk about the different options, VC or IPO. There are also now, uh, we see more and more hedge funds committing in the, in the game field of VC, like Tiger Global and all. What is your impression? Because uh, you are, you have an impressive uh, uh, background in finance. So, what are your your feeling about this uh, hedge fund committing more in the game field of the, of the early stage uh, VC? Because is it a treat or is it an, an, an opportunity? We know very well this world since uh, our first investor is uh, Alan Howard, uh, who is the founder of Brevan Awards, which is one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. Um, but looking at direct investment from hedge funds, I think probably can work in, in, some, in some areas, in, in IT, in cryptocurrencies, for instance. I'm a little bit, you know, I, I'm not sure that for long, long investments, uh, like it's the case in biotech, where it takes between five and, and 10 years uh, to, to, uh, to get a success, if everything goes well. Uh, I'm not sure they've got the patience to 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 do that. So um, I, I'm I'm not totally convinced that they will really uh, uh, do the stuff in the in the long run uh, in uh, the biotech field. So that's uh, why we need the structure like uh, ours. I totally agree. Uh, concerning you know investing in one startup uh, is not in there in there because first of all they are too big and but in the United yeah. States. We, we see a, a, a very important move from even in the life science, you know, they come, the, the hedge fund, and they buy uh, most of, uh, they, they see all, all, this, all the startup in life science who are in the series, in clinical trial, you know, and they buy and they buy out everything because they have the capacity, you know, to, to handle the, the yeah, yeah. Excel okay. of these this, 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 this things. Uh, um, you know, the, 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 the financial forecast. No, absolutely. Yeah. And but I think uh, if you look at the U.S. market, uh, uh, we, we, we observe also in the health care field, and I think it's the case also in, in other fields, that, uh, that many uh, uh, VCs or private equity funds also have, uh, you know, built their own SPAC mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to invest in, uh, in, in, in the sector with a, a different approach. So I think there's so much cash, I would say, in the system that... Uh, they need to to find uh, any uh, when to land <laughs> any possibilities to uh, to invest uh, in complement to what we, we already do so yeah but i think in europe it's a little bit different um i'm, I'm not sure i've seen some some hedge funds yeah investing in, in it uh, in crypto but in biotech i'm not sure i haven't seen that mm. yet we we have uh, we have now a good news from the Euronext. Uh, they announced it, uh, recently about uh, they are they are willing to 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 create a Nasdaq like subunit. I don't know how they will structure that, you know, to favor the the IPO of tech comp the European tech company. Um, what what do you think about this announcement? Do you do do you think it's a good news or or let's well, let's wait and see uh, how they will do it. 
I think your next is, uh, is very dynamic. They, they take a lot of initiatives, you know, in the past, they also uh, uh, worked a lot huh, to, to, to constitute the, the network in, uh, in Europe and, and try to convince not only uh, startups and, and tech companies, but uh, mid-cap companies, also private companies to, to come into the, onto the platform. But, uh, um, you know, all, all these initiatives are, are good. If it can, uh, again, uh, drag additional money to, to text, it's, it's great. Um, my feeling is that the platform as it, is, it exists today is, is efficient enough. So, uh, of course, there's a lack of liquidity, mm -hmm. but it's more a matter of, uh, of funds, actually, uh, and, and, and probably dedicated funds to the, to the healthcare sector or to the biotech sector in general. Uh, which is the, the main difference compared to the US, where uh, when you make an IPO, I remember uh, the example of Selectis, you know, French company. When we, I was the advisor when we did the, the IPO in France, I think we had a book of maybe uh, 80 or, or 90 institutions, and it was covered, I think if I remember well, it's a long time ago now, but four or five times. Uh, so it was a, a great success. But when we did the IPO in the US, uh, the, the, the CEO on the told me that you yeah, had something like, I think, 900 institutions in the book. So I think it's a matter of uh, one to 10, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and it's not just because of uh, the technical platform. It's mm -hmm. the main reason is that there are funds, there is cash in these fields. People are, are more, more uh, open to, to take risk on the bet, et cetera, than it is the case in, in Europe. And we come back to what I said before. That's, that's the reason why we, we created Eureka is to bring around the table new kind of investors uh, that uh, at this stage uh, were not present at all in the, in the biotech field. Yeah. You talk about new kind of investor and now you have a new oh, new era of what, I don't know if they are investors or speculators with the, with the, with the um, uh, you know, you know the the coin. Uh, I, 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 I you know I have a brain freeze was um, the the crypto on crypto yes crypto sorry <laughs> I don't know what happened to my brain <laughs> oldness <laughs> uh, so uh, we have now a, a new era you know of kind of investor of, of course they are the same but just they use a new tools uh, it's it's just an extension of, of crowdfunding and even equity based crowdfunding which is used you not know, the, the the digital uh, tools uh, do you think that it's come that's that you can also innovate um, on that field and calling you know this kind of investor you know to 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 invest in the equity of your startup or, or in the equity of the or Eureka or, or, or maybe yeah. like the organization of your startup I spent a lot of time myself on um, looking at the, the crypto world and uh, I mentioned Alan Award before but uh, he's himself very involved in the in the cryptocurrency world he's one of the he's the first investor in Coinbase uh, and he has uh, launched his own fund in this field so try to find connections between us. And uh, some, a couple of years ago, I was thinking about, you know, a biotech company which would develop its, uh, its product and uh, people would uh, buy some, uh, some uh, cryptocurrency around it that uh, would give, us, give them access to, uh, to the product in the future when it runs on the market. I don't know. I think it's the, the problem is the time it takes in the in the healthcare uh, or in the biotech uh, worlds. I think uh, it's it's not adapted uh, to the, the, the short term uh, kind of investment that we, we see in crypto. But, uh, That's why I was talking about more more uh, as a speculation. You know, investors yeah. are more you know uh, uh, interested by the, the the excitement of making short term. Uh, you know, uh, so okay. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Rodolf. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you. Maybe a last word. Would you like to say some word directly to, to the science world, to the PhD student, to the postdoc and scientist who would like you know, to, to join uh, uh, this exciting new era of creating startups? Yeah, but if, if I take again, you know, the, what is the, the motto of, uh, of Eureka is to, uh, if I summarize, is to use... Uh, uh, strategic artificial intelligence huh, to uh, mobilize the, the, hopefully the brightest scientists in Europe, UK, uh, Israel as well, and to, to launch uh, with, uh, with them highly ambitious, impactful uh, startup for the world. So it's very ambitious. 
Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, we are looking at people who have uh, disruptive ideas, uh, who people who want to change the world, uh, who, are, who like entrepreneurship. So all of them, they can join us. <laughs> We're happy mm -hmm. to, to welcome, uh, welcome them uh, in the two fields who are interested in, so in uh, microbiome and synthetic biology. Thank you so much. I completely uh, agree that uh, Eureka will be a great player in the field. The, the model is very, very sexy and, and uh, the, the people you hired are, are amazing. And I think uh, you will be a major player in Europe and in the world. And the impact will be in the world because innovation of life science is something great. Uh, maybe a recommendation from you. And this is for my personal, you know, I, I always like to ask my great uh, guests if they have some, a book or something to, to recommend me because they, they make me better, you know? So uh, do you have something to recommend for me to, to become a better person <laughs> or a leader like you? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the current context, probably we have to, to come back to, uh, uh, to, to the, the books of reference in the, in the field of war, which also is, is useful, I think, for the management of any conflict. So I have two books of reference. I have not read them uh, recently. I read them a long time ago, but uh, I think they, 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 are still, uh, they are still interesting in the, in the lessons that we can, uh, we can draw from them. So it's, of course, uh, close uh, on war, huh, the, which is a major uh, work, I think, uh, which uh, I think is, again, is a good source of inspiration to manage Uh, any conflict situations, uh, and notably to, to understand, I think, the, uh, the, I would say the, the asymmetric, asymmetrical relationship between uh, attack and defense. And also, I think, which uh, shows that you always need to analyze, of course, the deep and real cause of the conflict huh, to, to be sure that you find a, an acceptable outcome for, for all the parties. And, uh, Uh, the second book, of course, which is always uh, attached to the first one, is uh, the Sun Tzu. Mm. Um, I think it's Art of War in uh, English, uh, which is also another book of reference I, I read a long time ago, and uh, which I think is interesting. It shows that uh, any um, uh, any uh, any victory is psychological first, uh, and all the rest is accessor accessory. So. Uh, I think it's it's true for war. It's true for any conflict. So we should keep that in mind very yeah, often. I will I will add the, the reference uh, in the in the blog article. Thank you so much for being my guest. It was a real pleasure to have you. Thank you, Ari. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Serge Pamfer, PhD in molecular biology from the Université Catholique de Louvain. Dr. Pamfer is a serial biotech entrepreneur and investor. Dr. Pamfer joined UCARE in two, 2021 as a chief scientific officer. UCARE uh, is the most impressive venture builder in the life science in Europe, uh, backed with uh, 60 million euro uh, private funding. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it jobs is to, to, to create a biotech startup with two hot domain of expertise. We'll talk about that. Nice to have you, Dr. Pamphol. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing very fine, Ari. So I guess we can work on a uh, U basis and two as in French. So uh, please feel free to, uh, to use a, uh, a very friendly and fluid way of interacting because of course, uh, of course. I think it has been a long time since somebody called me doctor. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, in our world, it's, it's really on a friendly basis, and I'm very happy to join you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have uh, you. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor to have you based on your great experience. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important for me to have you today. And this interview, if you allow me, would be in two parts. The first part, we'll talk about a little bit about yourself, about your path into science and entrepreneurship, and then we'll talk more in deep about UK and uh, what you do as a CSO. So if you agree, we can start. Perfect. So, How did the young uh, Serge, who was finishing his high school, uh, see his future? Did, did you already plan to become, I don't know, a researcher or professor at university? Or, or at, at this moment, you were already knew that you, you can do something with technology and entrepreneurship? You see this book? L'Aventure de la Terre, yes. So that's the book that I received as a gift when I was nine years old. Wow. Okay. And page number 19 was about dinosaurs. <laughs> And that was my defining moment. Mm. 
at that time, I was nine years old, and uh, I decided to become a dinosaur hunter, mm. a paleontologist. So for different reasons, I didn't be became, become one. Uh, I became uh, an embryologist. And there is a link between paleontology and embryology, which is that if you look at how an embryo develops, you would recapitulate in a way the uh, the uh, you know the way species have evolved have evolved from uh, amphibians and fishes and mammalians. So there was uh, I'm not going to go into the details, you know, explaining why I didn't pursue paleontology, but. Uh, um, that's the way I try to solve my problem of knowing very early on that I would become a, a biologist and, and, you know, and having my trajectory through different steps. And um, yes, today I still have this book with me. I have even two copies of it in case I would lose one because that's really the stone, the, the springboard onto which my entire career and even my life as a person was, was defined. So. Uh, it was very early on, and I'm fortunate because, in a way, uh, I didn't go through all these hesitations and, and wanderings that many adolescents uh, go through and to try to uh, find out what they would do with their life. Because, in my way, it was clearly defined very, very early on. So you were already fascinated by uh, the life and how it evolved uh, from the dinosaur, from the bacteria to to, to complex organisms such as cells and even dinosaur world. This is extinct now, but so then you joined the university, you studied science, uh, life science. And what I want to understand is, um, so you, you wanted to become a researcher. So, so you have a, maybe not a clear idea what a researcher was at, in high school, but during your study at the university, certainly the, the idea was more clear. But at the one point, you know, you, 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 you shifted into entrepreneurship and biotech entrepreneurship. How was how the, the, the Eureka moment established in your head or was it, do you have an Eureka moment? Did you have an Eureka moment? Uh, Eureka, Eureka, yes, yes and no. Uh, there is something that I believe strongly uh, in and that's the concept of serendipity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and by the way, that's uh, the Eureka moment is exactly a good example of serendipity because uh, Archimed was working for a king who was trying to find a way to uh, to verify if uh, his his um, his collaborators were not stealing gold from him, you know, when were they doing when they were designing his his crowd and something. So he was really as a consultant, Archimede was really thinking about how to solve that problem, playing around with the concept of uh, density and volume and weight, and trying to find a formula who would bind these three concepts into one into one equation. Uh, and serendipity is really something that is driving my life a lot. Serendipity is also what is, I guess, driving science a lot too. And uh, I would say that I'm fascinated with everything that is about to start. Embryos is a good example. And that's why I was so fascinated in embryology. But startups is exactly the same. A startup is, is the beginning of something, right? Is the beginning of a company is the, be the beginning of a venture. So uh, that's why I am really focused on intellectually and also very pragmatically. I'm really interested in the beginning of something. And then I guess uh, my attention span being kind of short, I believe I get bored at some point and then I'm very happy that other people will take over. And that's exactly the same with a company when you start to grow a company and become very serious about the business side of it. I guess that's when uh, my attention span start to flick a little bit, and I'm very eager to uh, to move on to something else. And uh, uh, I did that for 15 years before joining uh, UK because I've been the CEO of a biotech incubator mm -hmm. in the French-speaking region of Belgium, uh, working with the five different French-speaking universities that we have in our in our country. And it was all about uh, you know, finding ways using the incubation model and also acting as a seed investor to build startups. And then, then at some point, I guess, uh, you know, what the startup would become was less of my focus. And I would be very happy to move on to the next project and the next project and so on, which is uh, well, something very, you know, very exciting to do. I mean, uh, when, when you wake up in the morning, you basically know what your day is going to be about. 
So for you, um, it was natural from your PhD and postdoc to, to move into a create, the creation of a startup because it was the same process inte intellectually. And, uh, and by the way, did you have some support at that time from your university, your laboratory? Because, uh, you know, entrepreneurship in, in Europe in, is something very new. Ten, I, I remember when I finished my PhD uh, in 2007, we didn't know what startup was at that time and we didn't have we didn't have in france any ecosystem and yeah. so okay I mean, it's a it's, it's a great question i mean i did my postdoc in the us right just at the moment when biotech in the us was becoming was becoming a big story with a uh, venture capitalists injecting a lot of money in companies like amgen mm -hmm. or genentech so it was really the very beginning of it and and during our lunch break at, in, 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 at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine when I was doing my, my postdoc, we were asking ourselves a lot of questions, you know, among ourselves. And one of the questions was, uh, who are the scientists who are leaving the ivory tower, who are leaving the academy to join those biotech startups? Are they the good ones or the bad ones? It was a great question because, you know, we were working on our, you know, thousands of hours to, to, to uh, you know, to, to, to find stuff in molecular biology to understand, uh, I, I know in, at my time it was, the focus was really on cytokines and receptors of those cytokines being maybe involved in cancers. So it was like opening a big space. We were talking about apoptosis, you know, cell suicide. I mean, how does that work and why and so on. And that there was this background question, uh, which was, I mean, okay, we are supposed to be the best scientists. Are we, you know, what are we going to do now? Yeah. So when I moved back to Belgium and I very, very early on, I was about, you know, starting startups. And, uh, and at the time, my university that you have mentioned, but I, want, I don't want to, to bath mouth it because they have produced great startups later on. But when I was discussing with officials, with the dean of the faculty of medicine, for instance, about creating startups, because I was bowling with ideas, they said, no way. I mean, this is public money to do you know, research and you owe it to the public to, to, to do everything freely with no capitalistic ID in, in, in mind. And that's one of the reasons why, although I was professor at that university with a full tenor, I decided to leave the Ivory Tower and jump into the biotech industry in Europe in that case. It was out of curiosity, it was out of frustration, but it has also a lot to do with serendipity because just at the moment when I decided okay, I have enough, I want to leave. I mean, somebody approached me with a great job at, at a startup in, in Berlin. And, you know, I was prepared to accept that offer because I had done all the, you know, the intellectual work to prepare myself to, uh, to leave the academy and to join the industry. So it's uh, like a combination of many things, but curiosity and serendipity were a big, uh, you know, a big, a, a big uh, energy source for me to do that. Uh, this is very important for the audience, so particularly our scientists who, who will watch the, the, the video. Uh, it's very important to see that you are a pioneer in the, in, the, in the life science entrepreneurship at the moment that the ecosystem was not maturing. For It was emerging, but it was not mature. So you, have, you certainly faced a lot of challenge and issue during this early moment. And what I would like to, to, to know if this talent that you saw and you overcome at that time as an entrepreneur uh, can also um, um, happen again for, for entrepreneurs now and uh, how you can help them to, to, to solve this, this challenge if they are recurrent challenge or they are new challenge. I don't know, maybe certainly both. I think passion is, is a great thing because, you know, passion believing in what you do or in what you want to do and the reasons why you want to do it is just what keep you what what keeps you moving right mm -hmm. uh, so you may have barriers in front of you you may have hurdles uh, you know on the road but that does, that doesn't influence you in a way because you are so moved so energized by by passion that uh, you know it doesn't matter mm -hmm. um, that being said, there is certainly a certain level of uh, realism, of pragmatism that you have to, to be able to accept uh, when, when you're in a startup, because indeed the startup is at the crossroads of different uh, interests. Mm. I mean, the people who are going to give you money, the investors, uh, they do it for 
a specific reason which is not exactly the one that you as a scientist willing to save the world has in mind. So um, one of the uh, key success factors in a startup is that people understand each other. Absolutely. That people understand that maybe they are on the same boat, they are embarked on the same boat, but with slightly different um, destinations. In a way, providing a return on investment is not exactly the same as finding the cure uh, to diabetes or to cancer. But you know, it, it's the magic is actually to combine these different uh, uh, stakeholders. I know before being shareholders, you are a stakeholder, and uh, and and to combine these different and to be aligned. And if it works smoothly, I mean, if nobody is in a denial, I mean, the investors have to accept the risk of science not delivering because the hypothesis was not completely uh, correct. And it's up to the experiments actually to tell us if the hypothesis is right or wrong. So the investors has to go, you know, a number of miles to other scientists to understand how science works. And the scientist in return has to understand that it is more about applied science than basic science. Mm. Uh, and that there is nothing wrong about that. That's how people are supposed to work together. Uh, and it's a team, team thing. And there is a lot of respect. There is a lot of alignment. And that's why governance in, in, in a startup is, is a key element. And we'll get back to that maybe uh, later because uh, as a scientist, um, I also had to understand how a, a startup operates and uh, towards success and governance, the way uh, directors, executives, founders, how they have to combine their expertise, their experience, their smartness, their vision together into one entity. That's really key. So. Uh, there is a lot of psychology being the CEO of an incubator and now being the CSO of Eurocare is 50% uh, uh, psychology, 45% anthropology, and 5% science. And all of this equal culture, culture, because I know you are very committed in culture also to promoting culture. So we, I would love to talk about this point, but we, the timing is short, but uh, it's very important to establish a corporate culture as soon as possible, a very good corporate culture. But we will talk about offline uh, about the culture because it's a very important point. So after 15 years of being the managing director of a, of a leading um, uh, life science bi biotech incubator, the, the WBC, you, you then joined it as a CSO uh, of UK, uh, what is UK? Uh, because it's a very um, a bold and uh, you know impressive entity uh, for promoting the creation of life science companies. So uh, please explain us what is UK. And well, UK is an investment uh, company, so it's not a fund, uh, meaning that we work in, in a slightly different way uh, than venture capitalists would, would do, or investor or seed investors, or even business angels would do, in the sense that we are working as a studio. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you look at the traditional value chain, you would have a scientist who makes a discovery, a finding in his lab, and then he would secure the IP together with the TTO at the university is working at, and then those people uh, would knock on the door of the incubator and say, we have a solution looking for a problem. Mm -hmm. And the best way to explore which problem to solve is, is uh, through the creation of a startup. And then, you know, and then you start assembling the different blocks it takes. The studio works the different, in a different ways, not exactly the reverse way, but it's about identifying a problem first. And then once you have a problem that you have decided to spend energy and time and money and whatever on it, you find the best people in the scientific world who may help you address that problem with a new solution. So it's really about a problem looking for a solution, okay? And it's only when the proof of principle of the new technology has been achieved and is convincing that you think about yes or no, you want to start a company. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So in a way, um, this equation where you have risk and reward and, and, and proof of principle and market traction, for instance, all these blocks exist in the incubation model, but the way they are ordered, the way they are assembled, the, 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 the methodology is slightly different. And we believe that working as a studio instead of incubator is going to uh, increase the rate of success and decrease the rate of attrition. But at the same time, uh, we are still very much open to the different models. Uh, and it's just a trend, I guess, that today um, we are still very much open to scientists who have found something useful, but we want to work uh, with them very early on and not wait passively as an investor would do that the company has been legally created and so on. We want to be involved very early on. And, and second, with time, I guess that our portfolio will be more and more and more uh, according to the studio model and less according to the incubation model. And that's why we are also investing a lot of uh, resources in a intelligence, artificial intelligence based platform that will help us with all these different steps that it takes before you create a startup, which is the ideation, which is uh, finding the best people, matching the scientific founder with a business person to make sure that the business model, is it, is, it, is it going to be a service company? Is it going to be a platform company? Is it going to be a product company? All these aspects are being analyzed and taken into consideration very early on, even before we start talking about a startup. Even before thinking about the solution, you're already thinking about um, how, uh, first of all, I resume, um, with, with, with your, let's say, artificial intelligence who analyze everything, the publication, um, article news, um, new, uh, social network, everything, you can, you, can, you can identify societal problem that worth to be solved, right? And this is different between the, the old school, let's say, uh, uh, technology push innovation, which first by research and development, we find a solution, a technical solution to a technical problem. And then we, we, we expect it to, 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 to apply this technical solution to a societal problem. And sometimes that works and sometimes doesn't work <laughs> due to you know, the high rate of failure of startup, as we know. But you have reversed the, 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 um, the let's say, the process by first identifying a societal problem worth to be solved, right? Yes, okay. and, 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 and to use synthetic or to apply synthetic biology okay. as a, a box of tools uh, to, uh, to finding a solution that is superior mm -hmm. to the existing solutions or even better when there is so no, no solution at all to come up with something. And that's, that's the, the, one of the key differentiators. So basically we have uh, the fact that we work as a studio, like, like you mentioned, the, the fact that um, we are our own startup. So we share with the, uh, with the founders and the entrepreneurs this same mindset, this same spirit of, of starting something uh, and then using synthetic biology as, as a toolbox mm -hmm. to, uh, to try to come up with proof of principle and with, with technologies that are being validated, but that are based on synthetic biology uh, as much as possible. I didn't, I didn't mention in the introduction that you have two domains of expertise right now. It's synthetic biology and microbiome. Uh, could you please explain us uh, what are, why these why this two um, domains, uh, era of expertise? And uh, of course, for me, it's evident, but, but I would like to hear it from you. Why, why did you uh, choose to, 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 to use this, this, to focus on these two era? And what are the possible outcome for, for us as a human being, as, as a patient, as a, as a benefactor? Of... Yeah, I think it's, there are many reasons for that. I mean, the investors who invested in, in, in UK in the first place, uh, they, I guess, were very impactful in terms of uh, telling us where they want the money to be invested in. And uh, I, I think a, a big part of the reason why we choose those two fields uh, you know, is, is just a consequence of them telling us what was their vision and, and, and where they, they, they really want to, uh, to, uh, to, to be impactful. So that's, 
thing number one. Very uh, matter of fact, if you look at market uh, growth and, and, and growth rates, uh, you see that microbiome and synthetic biology are two disciplines, there are two sectors where uh, the, uh, the market growth rates are expected to be more than 25% on an annual basis, which is huge. Mm. And third, on a more personal uh, level, I know in my life as a scientist, uh, I went through two big uh, game changers. The first one as a discovery was apoptosis. Mm -hmm. you know, the fact that cells may decide to commit suicide and the fact that cancer cells are completely unresponsive to that signal. Apoptosis was like opening new doors because we all knew necrosis, but nobody was suspecting that apoptosis would be an active mechanism involving enzymes, involving signals, and being kind of like very complex in a way, right? And also in terms of technologies, I was fortunate enough to be one of the very first persons to use PCR, mm. which was an invention. So discoveries, inventions, going together to make things that were not possible before their, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their discovery and, and, and findings in a way. So, um, I think synthetic biology is a tool, so it's a technology. Microbiome is more discovery. I mean, discovering that we are full of bugs mm -hmm. and that those bugs have, have some uh, very uh, precise functions to accomplish in, in our gut or, or skin or even in the environment because uh, we are very much interested in the uh, microbiomes in the ocean and the air to address environmental issues, for instance. So again, it's the discovery and the microbiome is one of them. It's a technology or an invention and synthetic biology is one of them. And what I see in Eurocare is in a way to uh, feel this excitement again of, of playing with, with new things and, and put them to the, you know, to the benefit of society. And uh, yes, that's, I believe my, my, my big motivator and that's the small beauty that I do see in, in Eurocare, in addition to, on, on top of all these, uh, you know, fundamental reasons why we want to be in those two spaces, uh, you know, as, 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 an, as an investment company. Great, great. And you have already uh, launched uh, several uh, startups who are very amazing. I just uh, want to, to cite uh, DNA Script, a very, very impressive startup. Um, M -I -M -A -A -T, uh, Pharma, I don't know if I pronounce it well. Uh, many, many more. Uh, if you want, maybe talk about some, some of if you want. Uh, they are very impressive startups and uh, very promising for, for the outcome that you can, they, can, they can bring us. The very good example in our case is, is Omni, at least in, 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 the, uh, in the framework of this, of this interview. The thing I would certainly like or prefer even to focus on Omni possibly in our portfolio because that's really uh, the great example uh, within our portfolio of the way we want to work. Mm -hmm. And the way we want to work is really having uh, or working together with uh, uh, you know, very bright scientists to identify problems. And the problem that uh, Omni possibly is, is addressing is to, uh, to invent new nucleic acids with new functions or new characteristics so that they could uh, fill jobs that haven't been uh, invented by Mother Nature itself, which is, for instance, to, to be able to store information in the form of, of DNA molecules. So uh, you could use DNA as it is right now with, with the nucleic acids that are available, but you can also try to come up with new nucleic acids who may be more extremophiles, for instance, and be able to resist conditions that uh, our existing DNA uh, was not meant to withstand, like acidity mm. or temperatures or pressures, uh, for instance. And uh, so this is really about bringing together scientists who were working in different labs. Sorry, if you allow me just uh, an analogy for, for, for people to understand. In, uh, I have a, I'm based also in, in the southeast of France and in Swiss. And in southeast of France, we have sometimes canicule, which is a hot summer, uh, <laughs> and all our uh, hard drive can burn, you know, and you can recover your data, but with the DNA, you will never lose your data. 
especially if you leave it in the trunk of your car in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Then, okay, but that's exactly a good example. Uh, you say, it's say more an anecdote, I guess. But uh, indeed, when I mean, we are facing issues about, about you know, the amount of, uh, of power it takes to, uh, to keep all these clouds and servers uh, alive, in a way. So we need to find, you know, to be really innovative and, and disruptive in how we can do that in the future. Uh, and, and if DNA or DNA-like molecules is a way to go in the same way as mRNA is the new way to go uh, with respect to vaccines, for instance, where it's, like, it's exactly the same line of reasoning in a way, you know, that you, you, you find yourself with, with limits, you find yourself with priorities, how to come up with a new vaccine within six months instead of uh, two years. And then you say, okay, I mean, I, I have to, to shake the tree, you know, I have to trust something else. And it's uh, going back to this word of trust, building trust. Uh, and, and, and that's also one of the missions that startups uh, have to endorse in a way that they are a vector of trust mm. between the technology and, and, and the public Absolutely. and the society. Mm -hmm. So it's all about vectors, you know, and you have to, to transmit things. And, and trust is one of them. Message is one of them. Hope is one of them. And... Uh, and, and have you know people converging into a, a, a collective belief, a collective trust into, into new approaches. And that's exactly what, what we are trying to do. Your care could be seen as, as a vector. Yeah. So uh, part of this trust building uh, challenge that we are facing, uh, and when we try to address it in, in our way, which is uh, via ideation and via creation of startups and uh, and connecting being one of the elements connecting the dots society being the ultimate beneficiary of what we try to do very brilliant and i'm totally aligned on that we need to to, to build this trust uh, with this amazing technology and uh, and uh, know how you 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 implement into your Startup studio is, is fantastic. Um, we are reaching the end of this interview. If you allow me, maybe two questions rapidly. Um, how do you envision uh, the exit of your startup? startup? Do, you, do you see them to become a big big company by their own? And or is, is it, uh, are they, are they, are they, let's say their path is to be bought by big pharma or big, big med tech? Anything goes. It's like children in your family. I mean, Absolutely. one may become a, a genius and uh, a, a, you know, a bright lawyer or something, and another one would become an artist. Mm. <laughs> well, if it is an NFT artist, then that's fine, I would say. But uh, no, it's, it's just, I mean, you have a portfolio, like you have a portfolio of children, maybe. You will have a portfolio of startups, and each of them is going to find their own key uh, to success or to be successful, which is bringing those technologies, those products, applications, platforms, uh, solutions, services to the market, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I used to say innovation is an invention that found its market, which is making money in a way, that money being re-injected in, in, in another cycle of, of startup creation, for instance. So uh, yes, I think anything goes because it's a case by case type of destiny or, or fate. Uh, some will be sold to a big company. Some will go to the IPO. Some will fail. Sure. And, and failing is also a way to learn and uh, contributing to the next success. Uh, so yes, I think that uh, there, is, there is no fixed rule. It's a case by case thing. And it's again, I mean, listening to a lot of people including the founders of the startups. Absolutely. This is very important because I, I wanted you to say it because for scientists who, would, who have dreamed to, to build a big company, they don't want you know, to, to be constrained in, in, a, in, a, in a path, in a, in a railroad. Exactly. Uh, it's amazing what you say because you, you give them everything they need to become by their own a big company if they wish, if they have the ambition, if they have the passion. So this is fantastic. Um, let's say to conclude this interview, uh, if you have one or two advice for a PhD student, for a postdoc, or for a, uh, a principal investigator, whatever, who, who, we know who, who is uh, in the academic position or in the academic career and would like to, you know, to, to follow you as example, how, how, what would be your, your number one or two advice? Follow your passion and keep an eye for serendipity. 
Mm. I mean, if something happens, if there is an opportunity, I mean, don't spend too much time analyzing it because uh, you won't do it. You just jump and dive and follow your passion and, and believe in what you are doing. And if you are a scientist, believe in what you have discovered. Mm. Uh, so I think it's very important to, uh, yes, it's fueled by passion. It's fueled by a little bit of craziness. Uh, it's fueled by, by this, this curiosity. It's fueled by many things and uh, they are positive in their own ways. Uh, so just go for it. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for being uh, my guest today. It was a great honor to have you and hope we will discuss again and, and with, uh, about this passionate subject. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Panfer, and uh, hope to see you in person uh, soon. Okay. I enjoy it very much also. And, and, and thank you to you for having the podcast. It was a pleasure. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Christine Thompson, PhD in molecular medicine from the University of Ulm. Uh, Dr. Thompson is the chief business officer of uh, Uric Care, one of the most dynamic life science startup studio in Europe. Um, Dr. Thompson is an expert in biopharma business development. Uh, from basic research to clinical development and pharmaceutical drug manufacturing, having Dr. Thompson expertise to back your startup, your startup at Eurycare will be precious. Will be precious. Uh, nice to have you, Dr. Thompson. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Very nice to be here as well, Ari. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, this this interview will be in two parts. You know, it's, it's the is the the game of this uh, interview. One we will talk about shortly about you know your path from uh, your PhD to the bio to, to the bio business uh, uh, world. Um, and then we will talk about your position at Euricare. So maybe you could uh, talk about a little bit about yourself and how you decided to 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 abandon the academic career of a researcher and but to commit, you know, to help the other academics to 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 launch business. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think for a number of of years I was really ingrained into the academic fabric. My father had been a researcher. Uh, growing up, I spent a lot of time with him uh, going to his microbiology lab and uh, doing you know, mm -hmm. science fair projects with him. And uh, then he uh, started his own startup company, which ultimately failed. But I saw him you know, going on the weekends to do his MBA. And I, I think that was really something which influenced me um, you know, to see someone trying to get out of academia uh, and whether it failed or not, just the adventure of doing that was very exciting. But I, I really you know, keep the message with me that it's not necessarily easy to do, um, you know, to find the right avenues, the right doors, the right, uh, the right way. So this is definitely influencing me today at, at your care. But to, to come back, um, I worked, you know, for several years within the academia, but also on, on projects which were directly translational. So real access to patients, working on projects with PTC Therapeutics, for example, or Boring or Ingelheim, where you had the feeling that if you make the great discovery, it's going to get to the market someday. So I think that when I was continuing at some point and feeling a little bit further away from that uh, connection, I realized that my motivation was waning a little bit uh, for my academic career and that it was time for me to make a transition. I was very lucky because I was accepted to a, a mentoring program, which is organized by the DIA Association in the US. And I was put uh, in partnering with uh, Jeffrey Sherman, who's at Horizon Pharma. And he was uh, absolutely amazing. He uh, really looked at my CV and advised me to consider a business development and put me in touch with a lot of other people. And basically the feedback of everyone was the same. Uh, and I looked at all the different types of pharma posts and definitely felt that uh, BD would be the best fit for me, for my personality. And then managed to convince a startup company to take me uh, with, with zero experience in BD, but I told them that I would work very hard for not very much money, <laughs> I should say. And as well that I would uh, focus on some other tasks which were within my experience level. So then they felt like they were getting a kind of a two for one a deal. Uh, and that was a great opportunity. It really allowed me to develop the competencies within business development. And I realized that I had a, a real passion for that. 
Um, as I uh, went on in my career, I've really seen all the different, you know, scales of drug development. And I started as well um, coaching some students in their MBA on how to create their startups. And I realized that was something which kind of, you know, now coming back to what I saw my father going through, I was very passionate about was, you know, how to, to help people along this journey. And as well, um, I was involved in some different mentoring programs, mentoring particularly women who were interested to get out of the academic sector and feeling a little bit uh, nervous about how to do that. I, I did feel that leaving academia for me, it was a little bit like being cut out of your family. In the end, I think everybody was really happy to see me succeed, but that was my fear. My fear was that uh, people would not accept that, uh, that change in my career path. But ultimately, I think, um, you know, the mentors and advisors, which I had, which were the most supportive, are really happy to see me doing well and, and making a positive change for other people today. Could we say that uh, maybe uh, the the era you know that we live now has also favor you know this uh, this this uh, this support uh, because maybe uh, ten years before uh, your generation uh, the, well, it was much much more difficult you know, to get out of the academic because there were not so so much possibilities uh, mm -hmm. so may, do you think that there is also a kind of uh, you know maturity of the of the ecosystem of uh, something that could have could also help it you know your transition maybe in part um, i think there's more awareness today that there's not enough academic posts mm -hmm. for everybody so i think even within academic institutions they realize that a certain percentage of students will have to leave and it's in your interest to make them aware of that uh, as early as possible and to help them find these alternative paths because you know after an eight-year postdoc uh, what do you do stay as a research technician the rest of your life I think we start to realize now uh, and academic you know institution as well that that's not a real viable uh, career path um, I think that there is still some hurdles you know because um, we still do feel a real um, loyalty to our PhD advisor, right? So it also really depends on their point of view. If the PhD advisor is really open-minded and accepts us to go to industry or to create our own startup, then that makes us feel really welcome into that community or to leave, you know. But if they pressure us to stay on the postdoc and to, you know, publish and that it's, uh, we feel that we're kind of promoting their own research by staying it's very difficult to get out of that. And I think that endures today. And of course, and that you're absolutely right. There is, there is also a point that you, I, I, I would like to raise now because during this discussion is this, this kind of opposition between, between the, uh, the need, uh, the need of the academics you know, to publish. And, and when you publish your, your, your discovery on, is on the public space, Mm -hmm. uh, and the need of a startup to have IP, you know, uh, intellectual properties. So this very contra contradictory in kind of, you know, fighting, you know, the neg strong negotiation between do we publish or do we patent? Do we, you yeah. know, this, this kind of all uh, this kind of discussion, discussion and you, you say the, 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 the principal investigator should be very open-minded and to understand that both ways are, are great and he, they, they, they have to, to, to dig the, the two way and the two ways and and uh, because both are bring a return for for their own career as, as academics uh, but also for their to for the student and their postdoc so it's very great to to so it's it's a message to the academic world <laughs> be open-minded well i think we i mean we've seen at least in in my lifetime a real transition because you know science when i was was a kid when my father was a researcher it wasn't about impact factor, right? It was about uh, the conferences you presented at, you know, maybe the, the journals you published in, but not in terms of impact factor and, and the kind of way you were perceived within the scientific community. And then it started going towards citation number, and then we got to impact factor. And now it's, um, I think, moving into something different because we do have, you know, like um, uh, online sources for data now which are, are a little bit less related to impact factor. But um, I think we are transitioning in this period now of saying as well, well, it's not just about IP either because mm. um, there is this kind of tendency now just to patent everything. And I think that's not the, the right approach either. So we somehow need to 
um, to come up with a new metric because it seems that we're really dedicated to, to metrics within this field. But um, I think it'll be a combination. And that's what we're trying to do is, at Your Care as well, is to look outside of the, just the defined metrics today and really understand you know, the potential of a researcher and of a technology without just relying on, on impact factor or citation number. Um, we're looking at startup projects where there isn't any IP existing already. So I think uh, the model is, is changing and becoming more flexible. Uh, just before we jump into the Eureka, uh, your position at Eureka, you work at, for some prestigious uh, organization, uh, Bioaster of Pharma. Could you say some anecdotes about your, your experience during this, this, uh, this past uh, adventure with them? Uh, because I would like also my audience who are PhD students and postdocs to understand what exactly, you know, what uh, as a business developer you do every day uh, in your job. Okay. Sure. Well, my, my first role at Terra when I was in business development was really about licensing. Mm -hmm. So you're taking assets at a company and you're trying to partner them with pharma partners. And, and it's very interesting. And the other thing I was doing was in licensing. So you're looking, for example, to take uh, academic projects from the tech transfer organizations or from smaller startups and to license them into your own uh, company. And that was really um I would say really based on scientific knowledge for me because I had to analyze the projects, very early stage projects, and then kind of calculate uh, what would be the market interest, what was the IP risk, uh, et cetera. That competency I really developed uh, over time. Um, the out licensing part, you know, you make a lot of pharma contacts. It's really interesting because it's fast paced. I really liked that. It was uh, very addictive for me, um, this kind of fast paced world. Um, as well, you have to like to talk to people. It's a lot about negotiation skills, but that's something which you get in your PhD. If you're used to presenting, you get these soft skills, which could definitely make you succeed within that career. Um, after that, I went to FAMAR. Uh, FAMAR was one of the 10 largest global CDMOs uh, in the world before it was sold off. Um, I was in charge of all of the development department business. We had uh, 12 sites in Europe, um, within FAMAR and we had a development team of 55 people. So a lot of that was um, working with different customers, doing innovation base with big pharma, you know, proposing new ideas to them, doing a kind of SWOT or gap analysis of their portfolio and seeing what we could propose within our own uh, technical capabilities. And that was really interesting because it was the first time in my life that I visited uh, a factory which actually made the medication, right? Because so many years I was working, working as a scientist where we just used, you know, uh, whatever we had in the lab and then going to the facility where you actually see all this discovery work which you've done become a reality, become tablets, become a liquid. And that was a totally different science actually because it's a way of, of bioprocess or of machines, of manufacturing, of quality control, of regulatory. And the learning of all those different pieces in order to be able to understand the customer needs uh, really helped me to develop a fuller picture. On top of that, I worked with a lot of biotechs in that role who were needing development services. And so I got a lot of expertise in understanding um, their failures and their successes. Um, that's, you know, understanding that um, if you wait too long to take certain decisions, sometimes you're really setting yourself up for failure. That was an important lesson for me. Uh, the other thing which I really enjoyed about that role was just, um, I think, the, yeah, the interaction with customers to create new products and, and really to reflect on that from start to finish. A, an additional part of that role was really strategic because um, they had some difficulties within the department when I came in. And I was tasked with really doing a strategic analysis to create the department to be profitable. And that required me to go into a deep dive of all the issues, the things that were working, the things were not working. It was a huge work. It doesn't mean that you're always really liked um, because sometimes your colleagues don't wanna change. But in general, um, it taught me uh, a lot about the business and, and also about strategic thinking. Mm. I went then to Bioaster. Bioaster is a, a private uh, research foundation funded in part by the French government, but also by private industry. And their um, strategic partnering is a little bit different than licensing because what you're trying to do is to create collaborations, but you want it to be successful for both, both parties. So it's again, really soft skills based and you have to really understand who you're 
um, who you're talking to. Because on the one hand, on the collaborative side, you've got a lot of scientists, so you need to put on your scientist hat. And then on the other side, it's a business person who's just project managing this. They don't really care about the science. They just want to, you know, get it done. So um, you have to understand as well how to, to manage those different types of relationships. And as well, of course, um, even if it is a collaboration, there is still some aim of profit behind it. So you need to as well be thinking as a business person on uh, different licensing strategies, different royalties, milestone payments, et cetera. Um, so there is a kind of basic finance role behind strategic partnering as well. Great. So after this past experiences, you were fully, uh, I mean, uh, um, fully trained um, in your skills, in your soft skills, in your hard skills, and your mindset also, because the mindset is very important also in when we do this trans kind of transition. Uh, then you joined Eureka, right? And yes. uh, how, could you talk about a little bit, you know, the how, how what happened when you, when you joined Eureka? Was it a, a meeting? You meet someone or someone recommended you? How, how, how was it? Well, I think that Rodolf, he found my profile on LinkedIn and felt that I had everything that he was looking for. So he proposed uh, to have a chat and, and we hit it off right away. I, I actually thought at first that it was a scam because it was too good to be true. Uh, honestly, um, you know, when I saw his message, I was like, oh, it's my dream job. <laughs> How many times does someone approach you for your dream jo job? I mean, it's not very often. Usually you're looking for your dream job, right? So um It's been, I mean, the team at Your Care is amazing and, and we all work really well together. And I think that that's a big part of it. But uh, no, honestly, I didn't know Rodolf before, but I told him recently, I felt that I knew him now for at least three, four years, even though we've been only working together for one year because it's a, a really good fit. Yeah. So uh, I totally align on the on the idea that if if uh, if you were, if I hear about, you know, Eureka, I don't believe it because it's so unique, you know, as a structure, as a as a way of of uh, of uh, cooking the the next generation of biotech uh, uh, gold nuggets. You know, it's 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 really unique. So uh, yeah. we have already talked about talk about uh, uh, all this point with uh, Serge and, and Rodolphe. So so people will 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 will, will have a, a panel of of different angle of the of the. It's not just, you know, saying it's unique just to be, you know, sh to show off things. It's really unique. <laughs> It is, yeah. So uh, could you talk about us, uh, about your role as a chief business officer at uh, Eureka? Uh, what does it mean to be a chief business officer? Um, because uh, at the same time, you're, you need to, to defend Eureka as an organization, but also, uh, I, I guess, all the startups you will, you, will, you will create in the future, yeah. right? Exactly. Um, so being a chief business officer at Your Care, it's basically, um, I would say, just being business <laughs> because you're, you're involved in, in, in a lot of different things. So one part of my role is, of course, searching and evaluating opportunities with Serge, uh, for example. So um, looking at the companies to invest in, um, looking at the academic projects to create startups, Um, identifying what could be the right indication for their technology in terms of market need as well. So that, that's one piece. The other piece of what I do is really working with our uh, external partners. So for example, talking to pharma companies, talking to other companies, understanding what they're looking for today in five years and 10 years. Because if we create a startup and all the startups are for what people are looking for today, Well, by the time they actually get to the market, no one will need it anymore. So we have to as well have this kind of um, clairvoyance, you know, um, in order to be able to uh, predict what people will want. So a lot of that is my job as well. I talk to the, the Pfizer's, the J&J's, you know, try to understand what are they looking for. And then um, outside of that, I would say as well, as you already kind of mentioned, is to take the companies in our portfolio and present them to the external partners as well to allow them to get feedback on what they're doing as early as possible because it's not very easy for a startup company where you've got a young you know entrepreneur running it to go to these big companies and say take a meeting with me so this is kind of my role is to get the meetings for them 
or present what they're doing. If there's interest, try to get feedback for them, try to get them key, uh, I would say criteria that the company is looking for so that they can advance in that direction. And I think that's really key. Another role would be definitely advising. So advising people on the, on the key um, you know, criteria, which other investors will be looking for as well, because at some point they will need to raise more investment uh, outside of what we can invest at your care. So I think this is part of it. And if, as well, just the basic business of your care itself. So we're developing a, your, uh, an AI tool internally. And then we need to contemplate the business case for that. So how many people will we need to recruit? What's the market analysis of that? Um, there is no, of course, um, creating an AI tool dedicated to synthetic biology doesn't exist on the market today. So then we need to basically create, um, you know, the entire, entire market forecast for that. So that's part of my role today as well. So as you can understand, a lot of different, <laughs> a lot of different hats. So it's a very challenging and very exciting at the same time. I, I, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing, you know, to, to live such an adventure right now because what we, we already to, to tell you, we've already told it, it's a unique uh, position. You know, I don't think that there is something like that somewhere else. You know, usually a business yeah. producer is, you know, very focused on, on one target and one product, one target. And, and now you have not only one organization, but you have plenty of projects that can, that have the ambition to become company by themselves. So will you also, uh, in, your, in your vision of your position, um, follow up your, your support um, as a consulting, but also operationally as a, you know, as a, uh, as a, you know, helping uh, your, your staff, your spin-off staff when they are, when they are fully structured with their own team, do you, will you follow up the, the, your support? Uh, is it something also in your, in your, uh, in your responsibilities? Yes, so I think even the companies which are totally autonomous today, I'm still presenting them externally, trying to bring contacts to them. I think for us, it's really about building an ecosystem and having an ecosystem means partners of, of different stage, companies of different development stages. So indeed, I think that beyond just the startup world, we're there for all of the companies in the portfolio and I present them you know, often to external partners and just say, oh, let me put you in touch with this person or with, with that person. Um, I think that it's part of, you know, I like building collaborations. It's probably what I liked about strategic partnering. So I really like putting people in contact with each other, even if I don't have a direct uh, benefit from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um I have I had a question uh, about you know if you if you do the difference between business exploration and business development, but you already uh, brought a, a piece of answer because you told that you you will uh, discuss with the industrial partner very early and during a long time you know to 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 have a, a good idea for the future what we, what they could need. This is what we call of course business exploration. Uh, and for you, is there a semantic difference between business exploration and business development, more, more sale oriented or more marketing oriented? I hadn't really thought about it before, <laughs> but I think indeed it, it's a good idea to separate the terms because um, maybe business exploration as well for a startup company, it's interesting because maybe you have a, a technology, but you haven't fully determined the avenue that you want to take yet. So some of this kind of initial fact finding, um, you know, freedom to operate searching um, for intellectual property, maybe all of that can be put into business exploration and maybe the understanding of the market in very vague terms as well, this fits into business exploration. Business development, I think could be a little bit more concrete, you know, where it's saying, okay, here's the idea, we're going to put X, Y, and Z steps in place to advance that. We've entered into the phase where we're now actually, um, the clock is ticking, right? And, and more and more we hear startups saying that, but for them, they see the incubator, ver, you know, kind of time as being like the 18 to 24 months for reflection. So maybe that's their business exploration period. And then, you know, once that's determined, they go into the, the real business development stage. And maybe that's, it's a really good idea. I like the way that you phrased that because 
sometimes we see startups don't have this critical period of reflection. Mm -hmm. So then there isn't a dedicated path that they've chosen early on and things kind of go like this. And in some cases it can still work out, but the majority of cases like that, it becomes very difficult for them because they haven't uh, had a clear reflection and that becomes evident to external parties and investors. And so I think it is, it is really, um, maybe the separation of the two, it's a key, key way to identify, particularly for startups, these two different phases. Particularly for deep tech startups who are very far uh, from the market. So I, I think uh, this vision is very uh, precious for them because uh, the team of the startup doesn't have uh, the time, you know, and the resource and the skills to do this kind of ex business exploration. They, they need to develop the tech and to find um, immediate application and immediate uh, um, market target. So you can bring them this, this, uh, this, I don't know if you can say it in English, wiseness, this, this, uh, this kind of insight, you know, from, right. uh, from several years of, of, uh, of discussion with industry, with industry executive, with uh, et cetera, with the right. also nonprofit organization and, and administration. So, so this is very precious. And, uh, uh, and once again, having all these skills, all this support in one, a structure such as Eureka is fantastic, um, and and I, and I mean it. You know, it's a, it's a, it, we were we, we I think we we were we we were all expecting something like this to to emerge in Europe. You know, and you say it, it it's quite unbelievable, right? But uh, it's great, and we, are, we will follow uh, follow you uh, very closely because it's uh, it's so promising, and we need it in Europe. We definitely need yeah. it in Europe. Absolutely agree. I think uh, what we're doing here is is really pioneering within the European landscape, and the positive feedback we've gotten has really enforced that message to us that this is needed um, and that it is the right time for it. Um, I think that being an American, maybe it, it helps me sometimes because I can say, oh, I've seen some of these things done already in the US and it would be great if we can implement this. But now having lived for more than 10 years in Europe, I understand that you can't do it exactly the same way. You have to as well have a European mentality uh, to, to make it actually happen. Uh, otherwise, you know, there will be too much kind of friction. But uh, I, I agree. I think what we're doing at your carry, it's a great story. This is why I'm, I'm part of it. I wake up happy to come to work every day, mm -hmm. uh, working a lot, as is everybody on the team. But I think we really believe that uh, what we're doing is able to make a difference because we talk to many startup companies where they say, oh, we hadn't thought about that. Um, you know, one thing I really like uh, to do is to leave people with something. So not just to take their presentation and say, okay, thank you for presenting, goodbye. But to say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Even if we don't invest, let me put you in contact with this person. Um, for me, I think that's part of it. You know, if it's not the right time for us to invest today, it might be in a couple of years, you never know. Um, but on, on any case, it's uh, really the transmission of all the pieces of things that all of us at your care have learned in our careers. And I think that we're able to look at things and very quickly pick out the strong points, but also the potential weaknesses and try to share those with people to say, well, here's where you might want to, to improve. Uh, here could be the drawback points. And uh, I think that's, that's really key for companies to get this feedback because otherwise you live in a bubble and uh, that's not benefiting anybody. So. Absolutely. We are reaching the end of this interview. I would like to, to keep you and talk with you hours and hours about this fantastic and exciting subject. So, but with, with everything as an end. So thank you so much. Um, maybe if you have some advice for PhD students and postdoc, or even if you have a message for the executive in, in the industry, uh, would, you have, uh, would you like to have some last words for, to, to conclude for this interview? Maybe for students, I would say, don't hesitate to, to show your CV around. Um, your soft skills are more important than you know. Um, this is really, if you've managed to finish your PhD or even a master's, you have something which is going to attract an uh, employer uh, and that you really have to, to have confidence in yourself and, and don't hesitate. Um, for employers, I would say, and, and other people within the industry, don't hesitate to look outside of the box for the right candidate because bringing someone in who's got a different experience than you 
it can really change uh, your team for the better. And, and I think that this is really important. We have to stop saying there's this uh, one set pathway, you should have done this and, and then we'll hire you. I think you have to look outside of that to find the best candidates and I see it, uh, see it all the time. So. Great. And maybe uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, a book or a podcast uh, about anything, it could be about bio business, it could be about business, or it could be about philosophy, anything you want. If you have something for us to, to share. So I think it, it's not a recent book, but I think it's a timely book because um, it, recently there was the death of Paul Farmer. I don't know if you know him, but he's a physician um, coming out of the US who did a lot of... Uh, social work and studies at Harvard as well. And uh, the book is called Mountain Beyond, Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. And it uh, documents his work in Haiti and also in Africa. And he, he died in, in Africa actually. And if you really want to understand pure motivation outside of money and someone who just wants to help other people, you have to read this book. And it will really help you to focus on why we're doing what we're doing. And, you know, the fact that the aim is really to get, you know, good therapeutics to patients and to improve their lives. And he was doing this uh, every day with no concern for himself and, and a very inspiring story. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I will, I will add it in the, in the, in the blog article, uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, you attract my attention with this, with this, uh, <laughs> teaching this, this book. It's very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for being my guest today. It was uh, so good to have you uh, and, sh and, ha and, and having your expertise and experiences uh, uh, for sharing for, for our audience. Thank you so much, Christine, and, and good luck to everything for, for Eureka. Thank and you very much. Hope to meet you in person uh, in, the, in the next future. It's a pleasure to welcome Michelle uh, Wilson André. She's, she studied life science, then she specialized to become a science and health uh, communication expert. She is now the head of communications at Euricare, one of the most dynamic life science startup studio in Europe. Euricare uh, was launched uh, in July 2021 in Brussels and Paris, backed by 60 million euros from private investors. Nice to have you, Michelle. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks, Ari. Nice to be chatting with you today. Thank you for, for being my guest. It's a real pleasure to have you. And if you allow me, uh, this interview will be in two, two parts. We will a little bit talk about yourself and your path from science to communication and then your role as a head of comms uh, at uh, Eureka. Do you agree? Great. Perfect. Great. So let's start with the uh, young Michelle uh, when she freshly graduated from high school uh, and she wanted she wanted to enter university. What was your plan at that moment? So I guess at that moment I was really interested in animal behavior and specifically marine biology. And so I ended up choosing uh, a university in Canada, Dalhousie University, that's one of the few to have a marine biology program. Mm. So I dreamt of doing that when I was in high school. <laughs> so you, I, I read that um, on your profile that you, you, you actually uh, um, follow a uh, dolphin or, or whales, right? right? Uh, on, on I did, yeah. Wow. And it's actually, um, it's one of the experiences that sort of brought me to my interest in science communication. So as, as part of that program, um, there was a period where we got to track whales for about 30 days, one month. Mm. And um, we were in the Bay of Fundy off the East coast of Canada. And we were tracking the humpback whales, but they also have another species of whale called the right whale, which was very endangered and it still is right now. But at the time, there were about only 350 individuals of those whales. Um, and the reason why their numbers were so low is because their migration routes intersected directly with shipping lanes, big shipping lanes, you know, transporting oil carriers, all of that. And um, for the past probably two decades, the scientific community had been advocating to have those shipping lanes changed so that it would be out of the migratory routes of the whales. 
And it was very difficult to do. And it wasn't until um, they actually engaged an activist organization and a professional communications agency to start lobbying the government and doing a lot of public awareness around it, they actually were able to get the policy changed that had the shipping lanes moved by just two kilometers. Mm -hmm. And that shift of two kilometers reduced the number of whale impacts by 80%. Wow. So it was then that I sort of realized, you know, um, I think research is always important, but sometimes we have a lot of research in a certain area and it's time to take action and convince policymakers to take action, start new companies, really put that research into action. And I think sometimes communications can be a great vehicle for that. It's amazing because uh, in the size of the ocean, two kilometers is nothing, you know? Exactly. And this outcome has been possible with scientific research saying just, just move two kilometers and 80% yeah. of, of the whales are impacting the, 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 the big ship. This is amazing. And uh, uh, so that was it the, the, the I think uh, the, the moment or the, the, the event that make you realize that communicating about science was something important? Exactly. Yeah, that's where I really started thinking about it. And I also realized that a lot of what I enjoyed um about research was not necessarily sitting in the lab you know doing the experiment or being out there on a boat watching seabirds for five hours but it was actually talking about it at the end and communicating the results yeah i totally understand <laughs> so um uh so then you 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 decided to 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 get uh, to to get the skills right, uh, and you 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 enter a tool. You get two master degree. Can you talk talk about these two masters? If you one in science communication and the yeah. second one in public health policy and and management, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, when I did my master's in science communication, I wanted to sort of learn about the broader field. It wasn't something at the time that a lot of people. Uh, especially in Canada, weren't really talking about. The program that I did was at uh, the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. And I think now it's been running for about 30 years. So it was one of the first programs to establish itself. And I really like this idea of learning about all sorts of different science communications. So what you might do within a museum, what you might do within uh, public sector organizations, working for a hospital or for a ministry, or then you know perhaps um, the more media approach, there were quite a few journalists in my class that wanted to become more specialized on science and health topics. And there were also a lot of researchers in my course that wanted to get more training on the media side of things, writing, um, you know, really how to synthesize complex information and make it relatable and understandable. Great. And then, sorry. No, 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 because it's very interesting to see how then um, you implemented all, all of these skills in, in, your experience, in your experience. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, please go, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I got you. Gotcha. Yes, and then the, the other master's is an executive master's that I did here in Paris at Sciences Po. Um, and I actually just finished it last year, so it's quite, it's quite recent. I took a, uh, about a 10-year break from school before doing that. But it was really, um, I guess, working in various research institutes uh, in communications, I became really interested in this link between research and our healthcare system and how we move research from the healthcare system, um, or sorry, from the, from the research sector to our healthcare systems. And, um, you know, in many cases, I, I got the chance to work on some public health campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, working very closely with uh, the Ministry of Health in Canada. And I really was able to see sort of the full step of the process, working closely with the researchers, developing something, having new clinical guidelines be implemented at the hospitals we were working with, and then letting the public know about this new standard of care and having patients be able to advocate for their, for their own health and their own quality of care. Uh, 
did you notice that there is a cultural difference concerning you know the public health communication for instance in france compared to uh, let's say uk or northern america uh, i think the public health communication in northern america or uk is more is more fun more uh, user centered you know than in in france which is very formal very scientific based you know we even a little bit boring sometimes so <laughs> because this is some this is the kind of feedback uh, I have from patients who say, you know, this this, this institutional communication are, are cold or are too much complicated for us. Did you notice this kind of difference, this cultural difference between the approach of the communication? Yeah, I have noticed a little bit. I guess there's a word um, that I was used to using in Canada that we call outreach. Mm -hmm. And um, there isn't really a translation for it in French. Like I, I tried to translate it diffusion, transfusion, and <laughs> it doesn't really work. Um, but I guess for me, even just using that word, there's sort of an, an approach that really intends to bring people in. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, I think that, yeah, maybe in some cases, um, you know, hospitals uh, in Canada, for example, might also have a private foundation. So they might have a little bit more budget as well for some of these sort of outreach initiatives where they're doing big, big public health campaigns and really doing things that are meant to appeal to the general public as opposed to just, you know, putting up the statistics like we might see from Communicated Press, from uh, the HIS and NSM, things like that. I think. It, it could be a question of resources as well in some cases. Okay, um, fine, great, great, great. So um, I believe that you can you can bring this kind of uh, cultural, uh, user centered way of communication to to the to the French um, spoken uh, organization. I totally believe that. Um, so um, can I say now? So you master both. Uh, pop science communication for a large audience and at the same time evidence-based uh, communication for expert audience yeah i would think kind of dual a dual way of working right yeah exactly i mean i think um you know we we used to have the saying that we would use a lot at at one of the research institutes i i worked at but behind every every data point is a real person. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that even when um, we do really want to use a lot of solid facts and you know evidence based in our communications, there's a way to make it both relatable and accessible, but still have the hard facts there. So uh, just could you remind us the, 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 the famous organization you work at uh, for uh, this past year? Because I, I noticed that you have a uh, uh, great, uh, you join a great organization. So uh, maybe yeah. you can talk about a little bit about the organization. And if you have some anecdotes, I would be delighted to hear about that. Sure. I guess um, one of my first jobs after I, I left Spain and went back to Canada was at the Discovery Channel, mm -hmm. uh, which was very media focused and, and sort of science focused. Um, well, increasingly less science focused now, but at the time. And I guess one of the things that I learned there, um, I had to do a lot of public relations and media relations. So a lot of um, press releases and trying to get journalists uh, interested in some of the scientific programming that we showcased. And I guess one thing that can be of interest to someone that might be new to the communications field is sort of putting yourself in the shoes of the person who's receiving your information. And especially when you're doing media relations, putting yourself in the shoes of the journalist. And I remember I was sending out press releases to journalists working in radio because I wanted them to talk about uh, one of the shows that we were featuring a documentary on the radio and timing in radio, you know, every single minute is filled and I was trying to get my work done in advance and I think I was sending them the press releases like three weeks in advance. And to them, it didn't make any sense because they're, they're not on that kind of time frame. They're on like what's happening in the next 24, 48 hours. So by the time, by the time the show was rolling around, they had completely forgotten about my press release. And <laughs> yes, this is something funny because uh, I've wrote some, uh, um, some uh, peers some years ago, you know, when I was a little bit younger. And when I, one of the monitor told me the worst kind of, uh, 
press release you can you can write for a company says the, you know the, the kind of we are delighted to announce you that the vice pre, the new vice president of this of that is mr or, or mrs this and you send it to journalists expecting that they will you know they will catch, catch the news yeah. yeah you know <laughs> so say something that they can they can excite them and uh, you know uh, and, and this is was really something uh, uh, I, I really appreciate to, to during this talk you also worked for the Institut du Cerveau, very, uh, very prestigious, and CNRS also. And Select is a very famous stem cell company in France. Um, how was your experience during, during the, let's say, this French uh, organization and, and startup for Select is? Yeah, um, it was great like working within uh, the public research system in France uh, was wonderful because I definitely got to work with a lot of really talented uh, researchers at l'Institut du Cerveau. My job was a little bit different because I was a project manager for international relations. So part of my job was sort of working on the international programming that we had. And another part of my job was also trying to increase the visibility of the Institute and sort of strengthen our um, international communications. Um, I think uh, one of the, yeah, one of the highlights I would really say is the talent of, of the researchers in France, and I definitely experienced the same thing at the CNRS. Um, in some cases, and I have to say especially at the CNRS, um, the level of sort of bureaucracy, and because it's a very large organization, sometimes I find a bit impeding, mm. um, because it seemed to really you know, sort of stretch the time of researchers having to do a lot of these administrative processes and not necessarily having the support organized in the right way around that. And I think also when it comes to communications, it's also an area where it could be stronger on the international side, because there's definitely a lot to showcase. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, how did you um, join Eureka? What was the uh, the that said the event or the story, how, how did you connect with the team and, and you joined this, this amazing new adventure? Yeah, well, to be honest, I was really lucky because um, I had a former colleague that I knew at the Institut du Sapovo that also works for Your Care Now. Uh, she works on the non-dilutive funding side, so she helps oh, okay. some of our startup companies find uh, public funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she's the one that told me about it. And when I heard um, just about the project, I found it really interesting because um, it seemed like the kind of place where I could have sort of one foot in the private sector biotech world and another foot still very close to uh, the researchers and, and the public sector. So that was something that I found really exciting. So that so this it was a, um, a friend or colleague who, who tell you that we, there is a great project that is that is under Cook, you know, under the Uber yeah. and. The, come and join us uh, something like that right yeah and i think at the same time too um they're going through quite a bit of growth very quickly and um it was the first time that they sort of decided that they they needed to place more of a focus on communication so we started talking about that and it turned out to be a good fit perfect perfect so um could you talk about now about uh, your role at Eureka and what does it mean to be head of communications uh what are your responsibilities? Yeah, absolutely. So just for, uh, I guess, people that don't know, so Your Care is an investment company that focuses on both early stage and later stage investment in biotech companies that are mainly focused on synthetic biology uh, and also in the microbiome space. And uh, for the time being, it's focused on Europe the larger definition of Europe, so UK and Israel included in that as well. Um, for now, so we, um, we're actually just getting started on a more robust communication strategy and building on, on what's sort of been put in place so far. One of the kind of challenges, I guess, is not just focusing on your care, but about the whole ecosystem that the company is trying to build through 
uh, the later stage biotech companies that it's already invested in and some early stage projects that it will bring through its specialized biotech studio. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is really be able to showcase all the amazing work that each of these companies is doing individually, but also show the impact that it's having collectively uh, in Europe and internationally. Great. So um... Operationally, you need to talk to, to the academic world, to, let's say, to, to the investors, uh, to big pharmaceutical company, um, even to the large audience, because uh, it's very important what you do, what you are cooking inside Eureka as a startup for what, what these startups uh, will deliver to the, to the society in terms of outcomes. So you certainly have also a, a large audience communication alongside the other lines. Uh, what is your uh, techniques and methods, uh, you know, for for communication? Because more practically, because maybe scientists would join would like to understand how you how you do, you know, your job. Yeah. I think uh, well, one of the important things is to plan, and I think the best thing to do is usually to try to put a sort of communication strategy in place for you know, the next six months or, or a year if someone has the time to do that. And when you're doing that, I think um, it's important to really identify what the vision of the company is and how you want to get that across to whatever your audiences are. And sometimes I think um, companies or young projects are not even sure who their audiences are. So that's another part of, um, part of seeing, you know, really who you're speaking to and what information is going to be important to them. So in a typical communication strategy, I would probably have a bit of an assessment of, you know, what's going on so far, what kind of communications are you doing on a daily, monthly, yearly basis? Are you running a special event every year? Are you sending out a newsletter? Do you have a website? Do you have social media? Taking a look at what's happening and then, you know, based on your resources, determining what's worth kind of investing more in, investing more time? Where are you getting more traction? You know, do you get interesting emails from investors when you're posting things on social media? Or, you know, is it more when you're doing interviews with someone like yourself or a journalist? Figuring out what gets you visibility and the right kind of visibility is really important. So I would start with a sort of audit of, okay, what am I doing? What's working, what's not working? Um, sometimes a basic SWOT analysis, analysis can be useful as well, um, just to help consider, you know, do we need to put a crisis communication strategy in place in case, you know, one day uh, we have a data breach for this project, or just making sure that you can be proactive on, on certain issues, and also, you know, not just on the negative side, but to be able to seize special opportunities, like if the CEO of your company is invited to a big conference, what else can you sort of work around that to you know, showcase what you guys are doing. Um, so a bit of an analysis part. And then the next part is just super practical. And it's listing out all the different events and, and channels that you'll, that you'll want to be focusing on throughout the year and figuring out who's responsible for it and how you're going to carry it out. So, um, of course, you are, you are going to, to, to use all the available digital tools you have under your hands right now, we have now under our hands, uh, video, uh, writing articles, etc. Uh, I just wanted to, to talk with you about, you know, maybe a side subject, you know, maybe you have heard about the, the DNVB phenomenon this past year, the digital native vertical bronze, you know, this, uh, this new bronze in, that have one product, one verticals, and, you know, they are very, um, um, the, we have fantastic brands these past 10 years, such as Feed in France or, or Asphalt or many others who are now unicorns. And they have a very particular strategy, you know, because they took the communication, but with the marketing mindset, you know, um, with the strong branding, you know, they, they, they push the brand inside the mind of, the, of their target customers. And then with, the, with inbound marketing, you know, they pull uh, these, these people uh, and convert them as a client and transform them into fan and evangelists. And, and do you think that this kind of strategy is something interesting uh, to, to bring for into, in, in, into the deep tech world or, or maybe not? 
What is your thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I do think it's interesting. It's probably an area where I have a little bit less expertise on the pure marketing side of things, but I do think it's important to look to some of these examples, even if, you know, the market that they're operating in seems totally different mm -hmm. from what someone in biotech might be doing. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, one of the, you know, uh, he's a big marketing guy, Simon Sinek, uh, who talks a lot about his marketing strategy and, you know, I think he's he's advised tens of companies from Coca-Cola to pharma and this notion of of starting with why mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that also really speaks to today's generation to have this purpose. And when you couple that with the social media tools that we have today, I think it can definitely be extremely powerful. So you have some good uh, opinion about this strategy. You're not some. You're not completely, you know, uh, um, blocked about that because uh, I talked with some other, you know, communication and marketing experts and said they told me abandon completely to try the strategy with scientists and engineer because they don't get it. So you will waste your time. But you believe it. I believe in it. So maybe we can uh, make it work with scientists and because the goal of that is to starify, you know, the science. Yeah. I think there are always there are always lessons to be learned mm. from many different domains. And if we kind of stay in our field, you know, as I said before, it's it's definitely not my area of extra of expertise. I'm not like an avid TikTok or Instagram user, <laughs> but I think you have to keep your eyes out for what's going on and and what you know today and tomorrow's generations are doing. Otherwise, we'll all just become dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Great, absolutely. Dinosaurs, yes, yes. <laughs> So it was a real pleasure to have you. Maybe we can conclude um, uh, by saying uh, some words. Maybe if you want to say some words to to the side directly to scientists and engineers from the academic world, and if you have some, I don't know, good books or article or podcast, anything that inspire you, not necessarily in science, but anything or you want to recommend us, we would be delighted to hear about that. <laughs> sure. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I think I, I feel really grateful to be living at this time with all of the amazing scientific progress that we've made and that's still continuing to move forward. I mean, sometimes, um, you know, at, at work, at your care, when we're talking about certain subjects like DNA storage, you know, like to store information on you know, amino acids, it's just kind of crazy. And it's stuff that- Sorry, Just to, to the audience, yeah. that are not, DNA storage is fantastic because <laughs> with the quantum computing, all the crypto yeah. will be broken. Yeah. The, only, the only way to, to ensure that the crypto uh, money, the cryptocurrency will be will sustain is to, to, to transfer the data into DNA. So I, I, <laughs> I start to say that. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it, and it sounds so uh, science fiction, um, but, you know, it's it's real now. And I'm just so uh, admirative of the researchers that, you know, have so much perseverance to keep on working on these things, because I know that, you know, sometimes research can be a very unglamorous job. There can be many failures. It can get boring. I think there are also problems with the way that we... Um, I can't think of the word in English, but like Valerie's mm -hmm. uh, researchers. And I don't even just mean in terms of pay, which I think in France especially is a problem. And, you know, a lot of French researchers, great ones leave to go, you know, make a better living somewhere else. Um, but also in how we can make it more um, fulfilling. And I think sometimes the hierarchy structures that are very prevalent in academia can really damage young researchers that actually are super motivated to, to do what they're doing. So I would just say to, to not give up um, because it's really fantastic and it's such an amazing societal contribution. Um, one book that might be inspirational and um, it might not be something that people would typically think of, but I recently read the biography of Leonardo da Vinci mm -hmm. by Walter Isaacson. It's the same biographer that did the Steve Jobs 
uh, biography. He's, he's a very good biographer. Oh, and oh. it's interesting because I didn't know much about Da Vinci, honestly, before I read this book. And he didn't have the kind of like genius brain power that someone like Einstein had, you know, like he made mistakes in math. He had no formal engineering or really any formal academic training. He was fully, fully self-taught. And the thing that really kept him going, um, both in, in his painting and artistic work, but also in, you know, some of the amazing engineering and anatomical work that he did for that time was his curiosity. And, uh, you know, at one point there, he discusses one of the notebooks that they found and, you know, he's writing all of these very detailed, you know, he's working on his war machines at the time. And then there was a little note that said, describe the tongue of a woodpecker. And you know, the woodpecker is the bird that, <laughs> and you just, it just kind of makes you imagine this kind of person always asking himself questions, always curious about the world around him. And I think that's something that we should all remember. I will ask you the, the reference uh, offline and, and I will share it uh, in the blog post. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, it was a real pleasure to have you today. And uh, thank you for what you do. It's very important for the community, for the scientific community, for the entrepreneurial community. So thank you very much for, for being my guest today and hope to, to meet you in person and discuss about science and tech uh, in person and in, in, the, in the near future. Thank you Likewise, very much. Bye, Zari. It was such a pleasure. <laughs>